Hi everybody, my name is Kelly Port. I was the visual effects supervisor on Spider-Man No Way Home. Previously worked on Avengers Endgame and prior to that, Avengers Infinity War. And I'd love to take you through one of our big action sequences, which is the introduction to Doc Ock, the big bridge fight. Hello, Peter. Most of the film has some portion of visual effects. I think there's maybe 80 shots that didn't have visual effects. I wanted to start the sequence on this particular shot because this, uh, when you look at it, this is exactly one of those shots that doesn't seem like a visual effects shot, but it absolutely is. This set here was built in Atlanta. We had just this door right here, the steps and the door. In that particular case, we had to extend all of this area on the left and right of that. So that's a really common practice, what we call just set extension, but it includes all the little details that come along with it. Digital animated leaves that maybe blow in the wind and things like that. That's just one of the first shots. Now, there's a lot of circumstances where you get into a situation like this, and it's like, Oh, this is a shot in a room. How could there possibly be any visual effects here? Well, scheduling reasons, for whatever reasons, he was not available when this part of <laughs> the movie was shot on one day. He had to be shot a different day. He's over a blue screen. This was shot separately. And this is one of those good examples of what you would consider an invisible effect. There's no electro beams coming off or arms doing something crazy or something exploding. This is just one that looks like just a normal shot and it's not. So this part here is part of our set in Atlanta. Obviously Tom is there, but all of this out here is fully digital. Now some of these pedestrians are digital pedestrians and some of them are extras that were shot on blue screen. It's a combination of both. But all the cars, the trees, the moving leaves on the trees, that's all CG. In a sense, it's easier to create the world rather than shoot it in New York. Okay, perfect, where is she? She left. To go where? To the airport. Even though we had a lot of aerial photography, we had this traffic that we're gonna be needing to be continuous with. When we shot the aerial, it looked nothing like that. So of course, we had to replace all of this traffic on here with cars. We actually had to move this tower. And by the way, not only did we have to move the tower, the tower is under renovation. So it had all this scaffolding on it. We didn't remove the scaffolding. We just made a CG tower. So you've got a whole bunch of mix and match of digital, and photograph. So this is sort of one of those hybrid plates. So here's Spider-Man flying, looking for the assistant vice chancellor. So what we ended up calling her is AVC, just for shorthand. He's flying in uh, at one point, just to talk about different kinds of previs and versions of that. We had him climbing up that tower, looking around, all sorts of things like that that we were just exploring. But, you know, as part of trimming the sequence, he's just now flying there and then you see him land. This piece was actually built. A lot of these things that were actually built end up getting uh, replaced, whether it's to add detail, or if it needs to be cleaner or dirtier, or if his animation changes and it makes it easier to remove Tom. He's on wires, he lands. We basically, what's called rotomation, which is your frame by frame matching what Tom's doing, what his action and performance is, and then you're creating the Spider-Man version of that, which is where he's wearing this iron spider suit. In a situation like this, and for all the shots where you see Iron Spider that are live action, we created a physical model, a bust of Iron Spider that we could actually put in that lighting environment. So it really helps us understand how something metallic uh, would behave in that particular light because that's how we ultimately need to light it to sort of get to match that, if not better. Tom does a ton of his own stunts, and this is one that he particularly did and it was, this is Tom's idea, it was really funny. Because he's wearing a suit underneath this iron spider suit, it ends up getting all wrinkled. So in this particular shot, Tom Holland is wearing the wrinkly suit, and we put the iron spider suit on top of that because it would be easier for us to do that than having to cre recreate the wrinkly suit as an all digital suit. We have this couple rows of cars, two rows over here and one row over here and this K rail divider here. But everything beyond that, the distant cars, the signs, all these distant buildings, the other bridge, 
all of that was blue screen and would have to be extended. So what we do is just match what the physical camera was doing. We have to create a virtual camera that matches that exactly, and then we're able to put our world beyond what the blue screen was. So now we're on a, a, a wide shot. There's a lot of visual effects here, but you, you, the idea is that you don't really see them. It's like, oh yeah, he's on a freeway and he's just running. This could easily have been shot had we been in New York and locked off that bridge. You know, it's a lot of money to lock off of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, I would imagine, but you could and keep shooting that for a couple weeks and get a lot of angry New Yorkers probably. Obviously, some of this is what was filmed. I think it was something like this. So what's interesting about that is that we have to, again, extend all that environment out, create digital cars on the left, the surrounding environment. Uh, Peter running, in this case, is all digital as well. Some of that was based on motion capture. Some of it's keyframe animated by hand. We changed signs, like this says JFK Airport, but that's not actually what it says there. But since the AVC is theoretically headed to the airport, like everything is like really accurate in terms of the signage and things like that. But we sometimes need to introduce things that say, oh yes, she's going to the airport. Because <laughs> we just said that. A lot of these scenes, these little uh, vignettes as he's passing from car to car, the dog, the two kids, were actually uh, just ideas that came up with, uh, that the guys came up with in the previs. As we get closer and closer to shooting, that previs becomes a template for how we shoot. And so this happened to be one of those shots, the dog barking. We had a bunch of other ones that were just not used, but, uh, and then in just this particular case, the kids had an iPad here, and that was just a blank iPad, but we took the helicopter footage and we just stuck that on there, added some Daily Bugle bugs on it, like it was a live broadcast. Here's a little Easter egg I'll show you, because it's already out there. We did do a little tribute to Stan Lee, that's his birthday, so. Yeah. <laughs> this was actually a very tricky thing. We had all sorts of reflections. We had camera reflections, flags, the blue screens, all sorts of things like that, that um, we basically have to remove them and then add in the, the correct ones. That happens a lot. Peter uh, jumps on the car, he's pulled on wires. We transition that into an iron spider suit. We get our reference of the iron spider bust. We have a gray ball, a silver ball. We do something called HDRI. The iron spider suit, we need to light that in a similar way as everything else in the scene was lit. Otherwise it won't fit in. So we put a camera, it's just a digital SLR camera. You do highly bracketed photos all the way from where the exposure is pure white to pure black, and what you're left with is the relative range of light. So you're able to use that image, image-based lighting, in a way to sort of help augment how we light characters that need to be integrated into a photographed or live action world. So we're all familiar with this shot. This is basically the reveal of Ock. We code our shots by code names and shot names, but it, that one is called HBX. 1980, because <laughs> I've seen it many, many times. I still remember shots from Titanic, TD35. Very difficult shot. <laughs> so this shot, I think, if you count up all the different versions of it, I think this, this one shot had over a thousand different versions, uh, of which I probably saw a couple hundred. One thing that's important to know for both uh, Alfred Molina and Willem Dafoe, we did do some de-aging because they're coming from a, uh, an older timeline. So that was a process that we had to do on every single shot of Willem Dafoe and every single shot of Alfred Molina. For all these kinds of shots, we had to certainly do hours and hours of research. We would take the uh, Spider-Man 2 for, specifically for, for Doc Ock cut all of his shots together, study them. We even had animators that worked on, on the previous film, so they had a real good sense of, of how he moves. And it was so great talking to him on set, Alfred Molina. When they had shot that, they had some physical uh, arms that they could play with, but they also were uh, digital as well. So it was a combination of arms that, that were puppeteered and some of them were uh, all digital. In our case, they were all digital. Let's take a look at Doc Ock's arms. This is a perfect example of the rigging and animation departments. What the rigging department 
essentially does is responsible for creating the controls for the animators to use. They're able to take the controls that the rigging department has given them, the joints, how detailed of a control do you want, where those controls are, how easy they are to use, how intuitive they are, and that feeds into the animation department who's responsible for creating the animation. This is kind of what they see. It's a very simple version. It's a lightweight version of the character. And then this gets translated, obviously, into a much higher res, photorealistic version. He has to rise and fall with the, with, with, as the legs are taking him if he's not just walking on the ground. We tried a few different things, like a wire harness. Ultimately, we ended up with, where he's standing on a platform like that could be pivoted. Uh, be, because his legs weren't moving or dangling in that kind of case, we often had to replace his body, or at least minimally his legs. And if he's swaying back and forth, something like that, we would often have to replace the rest of his costume. So in a lot of these shots, he's basically digital from below the neck, which is another thing that you don't, well, hopefully don't uh, notice. What's fun here is this particular shot was on what we called like a rotisserie rig that Dan Sudik, the special effects supervisor, created. We actually had to turn uh, this car upside down and we had Cheerios kind of falling in the air, things like that. But that was one of, one of the great physical effects that Sudik and his team put together. Uh, along with some others that we'll talk about. We were able to put the two parents in the rotisserie rig, but we just couldn't, uh, we weren't able to put the baby in the rotisserie rig. So we had to uh, composite the baby into what the parents were going through, which is, was in fact being turned upside down. A lot of these shots came in a little bit later as the cut was sort of refined. We discovered certain shots that just weren't shot. We didn't, we didn't have um, this angle, for example. So even though this is a relatively close-up shot, it's over the shoulder of, of Alfred Molina, this is in fact an all-CG shot. One of the things I wish we had done from the helicopter rotor blades, I really wish we had blown away some of this trash, you know, moving. It's that little detail. Uh, the fact that those little pieces of trash and debris are just not moving is really bugging me. It's one of those things, it's like, be nice to get to, but uh, <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> As we get into this sequence where you've got Doc Ox, four tentacles, iron spider legs, and so it's this, this crazy almost uh, swashbuckling sword fight. Conceptually, a, a, a section, like a beat of the sequence like this where it's the, it's the arm fighting, th things like that, starts in pre -vis. It started as a long kind of oneer going all the way from when they first start all the way up onto the top of the sign. Ultimately, that got cut apart. It's not just a brawl, a street brawl with two people fighting. It just adds that layer of complexity. Okay, so now we're getting to a really fun part of the sequence. Doc Ock grabs one of the pipes off the pipe truck and smashes it onto the car. Spider-Man's running and getting chased by Ock. What's really interesting and fun is to look at the blue screen, the original photography of Tom uh, going through this, and we did it in different passes too. So. Tom, again, doing a lot of his own stunts, would run through the pass and jump on walls and trampolines and do flips and things like that. He's an incredibly physical uh, actor. And then we would do this as different passes. The camera team had to really be you know, as accurate as possible to do the exact same move several different times. Dan Sudik and his team you know, rigged the big pipe that was pulled into the car at just an enormous amount of pressure and velocity on pulley rigs and things like that, physically smashing that first car. We augmented this, so a lot of this is also digital, ultimately. It's always fun to physically try to do some of these things. Even if it ultimately ends up being reference, it's incredibly valuable reference. You just don't know, really, uh, until you really get into it, what the ultimate shot or the angles are gonna be, whether you're gonna use it fully or partially, or maybe not at all, but it, it's regardless of w what you end up doing, it's extremely valuable to see that. And here's the second pipe flying, it smashes that car underneath, and you actually don't end up seeing a lot of it, but that's what's happening. We actually shot that as a separate pass too. Uh, ultimately, we sort of ended up framing more for Spider-Man and what the acrobatics was he was doing. John kept pushing us more and more, and this is where the animation gets refined. 
it's like, it's looking too easy. Like he needs to be like, like right on him. The, the tentacles need to be pounding and he just narrow miss after narrow miss after narrow and just getting really just beat to hell the whole time. So with Tom doing this, this pass, we have a variety of sources to choose from. We have what Tom was actually doing on the set. Now that shot ends up being manipulated or changed later. We can use some of that. Uh, what we do is just rotomate, as, uh, which is frame by frame matching what Tom was doing. Sometimes we do motion capture where, where Tom or one of his stunt doubles would run and jump and do a flip or something like that. So we can really mix and match all of these things along with just regular keyframe animation to combine in what we get ultimately. So I think this shot might be one of the only non-visual effect shots in the movie. But even though it was like just an insert shot of her putting her seatbelt on, I do think we actually retimed it. So technically it is a visual effect shot. Now this shot's really cool for uh, special effects too. So Dan Sudik and his team actually rigged a car to be thrown 150, 200 yards or something across the freeway into these water barrels. So that actually happened and you know, what's fun is that you, when you do events like that, you want to have a bunch of different cameras on it. So, you know, ultimately I think it, it just ended up being this, this kind of angle, but you know, it's fun to see the alternate takes of what could potentially have been in there. This movie is not about cars smashing into water barrels. It's about Peter trying to save the AVC. So you got to just kind of pick your battles and visually it may be really interesting to see all that stuff, but we got to get back to Peter and what he's trying to do just from a story perspective. Now, poor uh, Paula Newsom here, she's literally in a car, uh, again, developed by Sudik and his uh, special effects team, developed a, a rig that could tilt down at 90 degrees, and she was not a fan, so I think the terror that you see on her face is authentic. She did not like heights, she did not like this, but she was such a great sport and kept doing it over and over again. It was uh, elevated, probably, 20 feet off the ground or more, uh, and then she'd get in the car and then it would just slowly turn down 90 degrees and she'd be like, ah! And then we would, of course, um, put all the stuff back here in there. So all the interior car, that's real. So it's just blue screen out there and, and we would add um, Spidey on the top, uh, pulling the web or a piece of debris hitting the car. This is one of my favorite shots. We have Paula Newsom hanging upside down. This is shot on a sound stage. We had to remove all of the interior sound stage reflections. This really shiny car. So it was reflecting all sorts of crazy stuff that we had to remove, uh, not only on the car painted surface, but on the windows as well. What I love about the shot is just the photographic nature of it. It's a combination of technical things that make it look nice. It feels very photographic. It feels realistic to me. The fact that Iron Spider and his like quick turn of reaction is, is sort of comical with his eyes coming up and her reaction out of focus in the background. It all nicely ties together. And of course, one of my favorite things is, is being able to see Ock sort of approaching um, in the background, his reflection too. There's a lot of story being told here in a, in a relatively simple frame. I love this shot. What was fun about this shot, so this was shot interior. Tom was wearing what we call the fractal suit, the tracking suit, but we had a little patch of suit that had a little piece of cloth that could be pulled on a string. It was like a very simple gag when that got pulled the tie would, would fall down naturally. And he was actually being held upside down in the soundstage for that particular gag. About done yourself, Peter. Now, obviously this is a very big shot, this big 360. So we did the move, like a practical camera move on set on a soundstage to go around him. Uh, obviously there were no uh, tentacles or arms there. And then we had to get the timing of the nanoparticles merging onto Ox tentacles worked out with animation and we had to do a lot of iterations on what is it exactly how the nanoparticles attach and flow and move. So here, um, poor Tom Holland, we actually hung upside down. Again, he's such a physical actor and is such a good sport, but we did have to like play with his blood flow in his head and had to color correct some of that. It was very uncomfortable for him, and but luckily we didn't have to do a lot of that or at least too long because that was just 
is probably not very comfortable. When Ock first emerges out of the hole that he made in the freeway, you'll notice that his, the lights in his claws are, are red, indicating that the inhibitor chip is still not working, that the AI and his arms are controlling him. So you'll see that it's now a blue light. So from this point on in the film until he's cured or his inhibitor chip is fixed, they are blue. And then once they are fixed, they then turn back to white. And so when you actually catch these little things, these little nuances of it, it's like, oh, I, that, I appreciate that. A shot like this, where we have the actual car, it's being lifted on big cables and actually put down. But again, we deal with reflections and things like that that have to be adjusted adding awk in the arms. When he webs the door and actually pulls it off, that's an actual practical gag. We actually physically pulled the door off the car. This shot, uh, which ended up being in the trailer, these white lights are sort of like a timer, and so they are back time to the actual explosion that happens in the next shot. In terms of visual effects on this shot, the, the grenade itself, the, the pumpkin bomb itself, the smoke, this fire in the foreground. So this is a great example of the collaboration between special effects and visual effects. They are in fact quite separate. So uh, special effects has different terms, practical effects or physical effects, all the th stuff that happens on the live action photography. It could be cars really exploding. They rig cars to be thrown into water barrels and then they put charges in the water barrels to make them explode. They create these rigs that, that put um, Paula Newsome down at different angles or they put a family in a rotisserie so that they're spinning around and Cheerios go everywhere. Whereas visual effects or digital effects is all of the things that we add usually in post-production that have a digital nature to them. It's the act of compositing or adding animated characters. A lot of them can be very similar to what special effects does, but it's a digital version of that. So we can have digital pyrotechnics, digital explosions, rain, smoke, all of those things. There's a visual effects component of that as well, but it's just a digital version of that. So that's how we make the distinction between like physical effects and visual effects. This is another fun example of Dan Sudik and the special effects team making just gigantic explosions. Of course, we added a lot of different cameras on um, a take like this because it's a big deal. You kind of have one go at it. Whenever you see something like a big explosion happen, word gets around and so people in the office come down and end up getting a big crowd and you're watching the whole thing go off like a, like a fireworks or something. But it's, it's never boring to watch stuff blow up. I think we had like six or seven potentially crash cams, things like right close to it that would be unmanned cameras. Ultimately, a couple shots ended up in the edit, but that's, that's how it works. And of course, having a uh, goblin make his entrance, we weren't sure if we should introduce him at the beginning and have a big role in the action and the fighting. Uh, at one point we had pre something along those lines and we're exploring those ideas. Ultimately, we decided to have the big reveal like this, which is really fun. And so this is his, the older suit uh, from the uh, other film. We were able to get access to that and digitize it, make a digital version of it. Glider was slightly adjusted to be, um, as similar as possible from a profile perspective, but we did take some liberties and just design choices to kind of improve it a little incrementally a little bit, but it's, it's just fun to just play with this idea of him emerging from the smoke and getting that big reveal. What was really special is that we knew that this film was gonna be big. I don't know if we knew it was gonna be this big, but we just really enjoyed the process. And what was really fascinating and, and special, at least to me, and I know a lot of people that worked on the film, is just being able to go on that opening weekend. I took my kids to the opening weekend and um, just sitting there, I don't know how many times I've seen this film, but like seeing there, seating with an audience that's just crazy about the film and, and hearing their reaction to these kind of special moments, whether they're uh, tearful or surprising or their jokes and everyone's laughing. You know, we created this thing in the middle of COVID and this is one of the first films where people are actually going to theaters and watching this thing. It was more than we could ever hope for and it was just wonderful.